Hi everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here for the Imagining a New We video blog, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. Uh, this is a Source Saturday video series within a series. Today I am talking with people related to comic books. Uh, the idea of Source Saturday was to introduce um, teachers and other educators to primary and secondary sources that can challenge the ways we normally teach particular time periods. And what I'm doing with this series of videos is I am talking with people related to comic books about how we can bring things like imagination, magic realism, Afrofuturism to our study of history. I've talked to people that are in the process of creating graphic novels, people that have published things as independent uh, artists and writers, people who are uh, Eisner uh, Award nominated graphic novelists. I've talked with professors. I've talked to people interested in digital humanities. I've talked to so many people and the series is so wonderful watch them one by one or listen to them one on one or um, w watch them independently but together they really demonstrate the richness of teaching and learning history when we bring in space for art and imagination and interpretation so enjoy these conversations in this video i am talking with the creators behind denison avenue which is a Instagram project, although I don't even think that they talk about it as an Instagram project, and the graphic novella Denison Avenue. Um, Denison Avenue, like I said, I consider it an Instagram project, they might not, <laughs> is this combination of graphics created by Daniel Innes and text written by Christina Wong about the Kensington Market area of Toronto, um, also that which buffers Chinatown as well, and the kind of histories, the oral histories, the experiences that are grounded in place. I think it's great because of the fact that having the illustrations on one set of posts on Instagram and then the text on the other set of posts allows you to read the story both separately and together. And that is a key element of the graphic novella that they are going to publish with this work. But I think it's really cool to be able to see it on Instagram and a good suggestion for an activity or an assignment for your students as well. Daniel is an illustrator, a tattoo artist, a textual textile designer. His um, textile designs have also been on like bathing suits, which is very cool. And Christina is a writer, a playwright. She has had work in Spacing Magazine, um, Factory Theatre, and their work together is so unique. And they are being funded by the Toronto Arts, Arts Council, the Ontario Arts Council, and Canada Council for the Arts for their for their work. So I'm really excited to like talk with them from the ground up about this project and why or if they found Instagram kind of a cool way to pilot some of these illustrations and um, uh, illustrations and text. So let's go over to Zoom and meet Christina and Daniel. Thank you both for finding time to speak with me. I love, I've loved this Instagram project and like ha like the development of this uh, historical novella. And I'm just really excited to talk with you both. Before we begin, do you want to introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, I'm Christina Wong and I'm the writer of the piece. Yeah, I'm Daniel Innes. I'm doing the illustrated half. Um, and it's really cool that you're collaborating. I spoke to like I spoke to a couple other people in this series, like the writer and the illustrator, and the like the marriage and the working relationship between be, between the writer and the illustrator is always so interesting. So it's really cool to have you both in the same space. So thank you for that too. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so let's begin. Denison Avenue is a. Um, like you said, a graphic novella. Uh, I like to just call it a really cool Instagram project because I love being able to think about it in this format as well. So let's just begin. Can you tell me about Denison Avenue and 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 what you're doing here? Uh, yeah, so as you said, Denison Avenue is a graphic novel novella and it's set in Toronto's Chinatown and Kensington Market neighborhood. Um, the story follows uh, Mrs. Choi Sum Wong as she collects bottles and cans around the Toronto streets. 
um, as she deals with, as a, sorry, as a way of her dealing with the loss of her husband. Um, and it's also an ode to the neighborhood of Chinatown in Kensington. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I really love about it is that the text can stand on its own and the illustrations. Was that the design of it? Yeah, it's going to be basically presented as kind of two separate pieces that go together. So mm -hmm. my illustrations are going to follow a walk through the neighborhood of the lead character. Then there'll be a map in the middle of the book and Christina's story will be on the other side of the book. So you can start from either side and the stories could be read as independent stories or together. And when you came up with it, did you imagine it as a book and Instagram felt, felt like a good place to um, put your material out? Or did you kind of start with Instagram and then be like, let's publish it in, as a book? The, the book was the yeah. books uh, is, is the thing we plan on making yeah. the instagram is just uh using instagram just as to promote it. its marketing machine which is what it does best <laughs> so yeah j j just a way to promote it and have like get some sort of it's, it's nice to be able to get some feedback from the instagram as well as we're working and to see who's interested I mean, I feel like you really should take ownership. You should take the ownership back from Instagram as a marketing machine and be like, yes, Instagram can do a lot of really interesting things in this media or with this media. And we just thought like, let's explore this here first. <laughs> yeah, you're talking to someone that doesn't have internet at home. So <laughs> I don't know. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, like, um, you know, I, I've talked about things like getting students to create digital stories to tell certain parts of histories and geographies. And one of the things that I've written in this like ebook, this, uh, yeah, this ebook resource for teachers is like, just ask your students what type of tools that can make a digital story. So when I see something like this, to me, it's also like, just ask your students how they, like young people, how they might want to put something together. So just own that just by not having internet at home. Sure, sure. <laughs> so what are the things that you really wanted to pull up from the story and the neighborhood that you really wanted to ensure were in the text or uh, in the illustrations? And I can like click um, on them as well if you want to like, uh, you know, look closely at one of them. Uh, well, we wanted to show, um, I guess, the loss of the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, and, and the, I guess, the old and new and what's changed and what's still around. Um, but we also want to bring attention to a neighborhood that's, um, you know, it's majority uh it's a marginalized community and we normally don't get a lot of or we don't normally learn about those kind of communities mm -hmm. in history textbooks <laughs> yeah and did you like when you chose the character that you really wanted to focus on was that a choice to choose a type of character you you don't often see in textbooks or you know did you see somebody on the street that really inspired you or was it kind of a mix of all of that yeah um so the main character is uh inspired by the women and the seniors that i see on the streets for mm -hmm. i guess the last five years i've been really interested in their stories um and actually one of my grandmother's friends um does collect the bottles and I see her, she lives in the same neighborhood. Um, and I saw her one day and she had asked uh, how my grandmother and my dad were doing and cause she hasn't seen them for so long. So I said to her, unfortunately they, they passed away. So as she kind of left, she kind of just said, oh, it's in, in Toy Son or Hoi Son, which is kind of like a, a dialect of Cantonese, but not quite. Um, but she said, it's a road we all must walk on. So in that, mm. that line alone just kind of inspired this story about 
um, loss and it's, I guess, loss in of the husband, but also loss of a neighborhood and loss of the language. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like um, through all of those types of loss, uh, loss of certain types of culture. And it's interesting because when I see, especially the, like the way that the story progresses and the, the, the graphics of it, it seems both in the past, but also very present. Um, so did you do any, like, did you do any, I mean, research sounds really like heavy, but did you look at any other, like, again, archival material <laughs> seems pretty heavy, but like were the elements of the story and the illustrations from your own kind of daily um, experiences in the spaces or did you do the extra research to pull something different out than maybe you would have seen or heard otherwise? So, so the, um, for the photos, for me, like my job's a bit easier. I'm mostly walking around the neighborhood that I live in and photographing places um, and just doing a little bit of research to things that I remember being there as well as looking into what was there before. Um, mm -hmm. Talking to a lot of people in Kensington is a bit easier most of them do have photos they have there, there there's a few more a few businesses that have been there longer or people that still live in that neighborhood longer whereas chinatown seems to be changing over a lot quicker mm -hmm. so there's it's, it's for for images from chinatown that i'm researching a lot of them are from books or just from online when I can't find them in books. Like there's a Spadina Avenue book, maybe put out 30 years ago, I think, that um, has a lot of good photo reference. And uh, otherwise just, just asking people in worst case scenario, looking on Google and just searching street addresses and seeing what I can find and asking around as well as is good for me but yeah. yeah i've been i guess drawing a lot from my own life um and just some of my parents and grandparents things um have brain, brought inspiration for me um i've been really looking at the city directories which are very helpful <laughs> about <laughs> researching um previous i guess what a building used to be. So that's mm -hmm. been very, very helpful. It's a shame that Toronto Archives isn't open <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. Um, but they've been very helpful through email um, with questions. Um, yeah, and just looking at old photos and just kind of um, talking to my um, family association, which is the Wong Association and seeing what stories they remember. And um, yeah, and just putting in my own imagination into the story as well has i know um christina had talked about like loss and um and even too when you were saying like places and the memories they have because i feel this like enormous sense of loss when i go to certain coffee shops where i've done a lot of like writing because you can't sit there anymore and then i'll walk another street and stores aren't open because of covid mm -hmm. is anything about your writing or creating process different because of COVID? Uh, the research is harder, like the, yeah. we can't go to the archives. Um, a lot of stores are closed where I've talked to people about um, the location and asked for photos. Um, but I don't know. Is there like, um, I guess, I guess like a more impending sense of loss <laughs> that you're thinking well, of now? That's all I guess. Uh, a lot of the businesses have actually closed while I've been working on a drawing. Mm. So the current walkthrough panels, like each page has a memory of, of that location and then the final location. But now a lot of the final locations are changing. So for the few pages I've been finishing, I'm starting with the old memory 
parts of the pages first and I'm waiting to finish the bottom halves, the bottom halves, because so many businesses are going to close. Yeah. Even in the 20 pages I have left, probably at least five of them will close by the time this year is over. So things are changing like that. So it does, it's strange and like doing these drawings about loss, prob probably half of those businesses will be gone at the end of this year as well. Yeah. So that really dates the book immediately <laughs> before it's even out, which with my half anyway. So it's, yeah. it, it's strange noticing yeah. that. Yeah, I guess um, when I'm writing, I there's, I guess, flashbacks or like scenes I write in the past. So it's kind of interesting to remember what used to be like 20, 30 years ago and how it transitioned to now and what it will transition to. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting to see, trace that kind of loss as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because <laughs> like, culturally we're like in a really interesting place of loss that I don't know like people have experienced together so much in decades, right? So it's, it's, it, it, it's strange how so many places in the neighborhood have such fond memories or strong memories. So drawing them accurately is important for me. So to create, I, I guess, some sort of historical document, I don't know. So how would you, or would you say that work like this can help like uh, a teacher or a student um, learn about history and geography differently? Like if they use your work or if they model their work on your work? Um, I feel like it's important to highlight stories from communities and groups that we normally don't hear or we don't normally see in textbooks um, just because I guess Chinatown, for example, um, I didn't learn much about Chinese history or Chinese in Toronto um, or in Canada um, at all in elementary school. And I think it says a lot of who we leave out in history books and geography mm. books. Um, and that's for both of us, it's really important to highlight um, these uh, narratives and stories and communities. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, would sorry, you, blank. <laughs> would you <laughs> recommend, would you recommend like the pairing of illustrations and text, like the way that you're doing it for, for young people, or do you think it already like takes familiarity with the different types of art to then bring it together? Um, well, it's, just ha having the kind of hands-on approach to walking around the neighborhood so many times and really like talking to people about it and noticing like drawing the neighborhood has been good because you just you, you notice so many different things about it um, about the architecture about the how the people interact with it and um yeah, so I, I do think you learn a lot that way, and be, but also like forcing yourself to talk to everyone about the neighborhood is you is a way to learn so many other mm -hmm. things because you you don't get that kind of conversation otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's important. Like, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you please. I was going to say, oral history is really important, or just talking to people and, I guess, recording their stories and just, um, that's a good way of, I guess, if a class wanted to do that and, you know, learn about history or geography that way, I think that's also important because I, you know, there's generations that will be gone soon <laughs> and it's yeah. a way of um, commemorating and documenting and, um, I don't know, keeping or preserving stories. For the future. Well, that's actually what I was going to ask. Like, do you, because you both have talked about elements of oral history, do you consider this a type of oral history? Um, I, I get, 
well <laughs> kind of yeah like because I hear that so much from what you're, yeah. you're like how you're thinking through it but that isn't necessarily how I would read the story and it's like cool to think of that extra layer of oral history kind of built in um I know for me when I'm writing the language um toy son is um it's it's not exactly a written language it's um, more of an oral so I write what I hear and it can vary between what village or county you're from when I do input it in um and that's um for me it's a way of preserving the language because it's you don't hear it as often in Chinatowns anymore. You did when they first were created, because mm -hmm. that was where the first, I guess, generation of Chinese immigrants um, came from. And um, now it's a new wave of um, either Mandarin or Fujianese or Fujian, sorry, I don't know how to say it. Um, you hear that more in Chinatown these days. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting shift. So I want to preserve the the toy song language in in my own way and before I I guess lose it because I don't really have many people to speak it to anymore mm -hmm. yeah, yeah my part of the book it, it, it is more just like my sort of personal visual history of the neighborhood mixed in with um current current walk through the neighborhood too so it's um oh, a lot of the images are from before I was involved with Chinatown, but a lot of them are also just things that were personal to me. Yeah, it's it's beautiful, both the story and the story through the illustrations. It's really wonderful. So and I'll just say like this one, every time uh, my mom and I drive by this store, she'll like tell me about like her husband, her first husband from like 1968 or whatever. And I'm like, okay, mom, don't worry. Other people have shopped there since you <laughs> shopped there. <laughs> um, but like that highlights this like layering, right? Of story and place, which I think your work does so well. So what's the next stage? People can see the Instagram account, but um, where can they get the book? Um, or when can they get the we're book? Hoping, <laughs> we're hoping to maybe pitch to publishers. <laughs> or yeah, we, we're still <laughs> like I'm still finishing some pages, and Christina's still, yeah, still working, working on, the story. on the draft. So, <laughs> so by the end of the year, we plan on having everything finished, and then we have to find a publisher for it. So it's a bit tricky with COVID, but we'll hopefully be mailing out some sample books yeah. once it's done and then yeah go from there <laughs> uh, and are those layouts behind you uh, some of, yeah 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 it's i guess it's my process and or our process yeah i'll i'll email you some some pictures as well that'd be great those that are, yeah that you can use so yeah. Well, thank you. This was really interesting. It was so nice to meet both of you and to just think about that connection between place and history and experience and oral history and loss. And I can't wait to see like the project kind of finished. I, that seemed like I had a lot of pressure on you, <laughs> but I was just saying I like the project and I'm really like excited to be able to introduce kind of some new people to the project so that they too can um, eagerly await a final product. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. having us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, have a great rest of the evening and I will talk to you later. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.